Hey, Coach Ryan here from Viper. I am in the pit today, and I want to talk about thermodynamics or the science of energy and heat as it relates to changing your body composition, burning fat, or gaining muscle. So, to back it up, since day one, registered and licensed dietitians have claimed that losing body fat or gaining muscle is a function of calories in versus calories out. In other words, if you eat more calories than you burn, you gain weight, and vice versa. This led to a lot of people going on super restrictive low calorie diets, trying to lose weight, only to jeopardize their health and end up looking worse than they, they did when they started the diet. So fast forward now to the late 90s and early 2000s, and you got a crop of doctors, trainers, coaches, and celebrities coming along saying that the dietitians are idiots, calories don't matter, this was more about the hormone response to food and toxins and non-paleo foods and gluten, basically anything but calories was to blame for the obesity epidemic. This anti dietitian sector of the fitness industry will give example after example of how the calories in versus calories out equation is flawed. So who's right? Are the laws of thermodynamics BS? Let's dive into that today. So we'll talk about how this all came about. The early work in physics on thermodynamics was done in a bomb calorimeter, which is a closed system. There's no way to leak energy and you directly measure the heat in calories or kilocalories technically from combusting certain food sources. In other words, you drop four ounces of chicken breast in that bad boy, combust it, you get 184 kilocalories of heat produced. There's no variables in the system, just the food source and how much energy it can produce. Now, the human body is not a closed system. It's an open system with many variables to account for. So this means you can't just do some fancy math equation on calories and expect it to work exactly as you planned. I see it all the time in a lot of people. Someone uses an estimation to figure out the metabolic rate and activity levels, and they sign an arbitrary calorie deficit, expand it out over the course of 16 weeks, and think that they've got it made. You know, you'll hear them say something like, I'm gonna lose two pounds per week with this calorie deficit, and in 16 weeks, I'll be 32 pounds lighter. Simple, right? It may work great for a few weeks, or it may not, and then all of a sudden, they're not tracking toward their targets anymore. So what the heck happened? Is proof that the calories in versus calories out model is inaccurate? Not so fast. There are various things that impact both the calories in and the out part of the equation, but that doesn't mean that the equation isn't still there and operating. It simply demonstrates the difficulty of measuring against an open versus a closed system. I know you need examples, so let's talk about a few examples. First example, if you eat a ton of fiber with a high fat meal, the fiber can actually bind some of the fat and carry it out of your intestines undigested. This reduces the calories in part of the equation without you even realizing it. Another example is the fact that human metabolism is extremely adaptable. Your metabolic rate will respond directly to how many calories you're eating as well as the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating. If you eat a low calorie diet for a long time, your active thyroid hormone or T3 production will actually decrease. Also, the conversion of T4 to T3, which is an important step in determining your metabolic rate, that will decrease as well. So sometimes you hear someone eating a very low calorie diet for a long time, they're struggling to lose weight, they're on a plateau, and then their coach or dietitian gives them a slight increase in calories, and boom, all of a sudden they start losing weight. That proof the calories in versus calories out is a farce? Not at all. In that instance, you simply increase the calories out portion of the equation by raising metabolic rate with an increase in calories which increased T3 production, gives you a leptin boost, increased conversion of T4 to T3. Um, so you're changing the calories out, you're changing the equation. Here's another one you'll hear. Well, my client wasn't losing weight, so I kept the calories exactly the same, and I just decreased the carbs, increased protein, all of a sudden they lost weight. Again, in this example, calorie intake remained exactly the same. So why did the person begin losing weight? Simple, protein is more thermogenic for digestion. In other words, you burn more calories digesting a big hunk of animal flesh than you do a piece of bread. So even though the calorie intake was the same, you again changed the calories out portion of the equation. There are many more examples of the variables that impact this seemingly simple equation, but we'll move on because by now, you should probably get the point, I hope anyways. Now all that being said, what the heck does this really mean in practical real world results? Should you automatically start weighing and measuring every last gram of food, counting calories to a T? Not so fast there, all right? I'm gonna ask you a question. Why be super precise trying to determine calories in by weighing and measuring everything when you can't possibly be as precise when determining calories out 
unless you're hooked up to a metabolic cart in a dietetics lab 24 7 all right did you forget your keys one day have to run upstairs an extra time did you adjust your calorie intake for that i gotcha did you go to the grocery store today how'd you adjust your diet for that walking around the grocery store carrying groceries up the stairs into your house hopefully you can see what i'm getting at here even though your body operates on the calories in versus calories out equation at its core there's so many things that influence it and impact both the in and the outside of the equation that it becomes a chore to track. Now there are some practical ways, however, to get an idea of where you are in relationship to this equation. If your body weight's staying the same, then you're roughly eating what you're burning over time with no net calorie deficit or net surplus. If you're actively losing weight on the scale, then you're in a calorie deficit and you're burning more than you're eating. Now there's many factors that come into play uh, in terms of determining whether you're losing fat, fluid, or lean muscle mass. But that's a, another video for another day. We're getting too long already. Finally, if the scale's going up, then you're eating more than you're burning, which would be a good thing if you want to gain muscle, bad thing if you're trying to lose body fat, uh, depending on your goals. So here's the tricky part. Based on how, how well hydrated you are, how much undigested food's in your digestive tract, how many carbs you had the day before, which pull in water weight, when the last time you had a big steamy poop was, uh, your weight can fluctuate dramatically from day to day. So how do you account for this? How do you determine your state? Simple. You weigh yourself several times over a set period and take the average. So I have my online clients weigh themselves typically between three to seven times a week and report to me their average. If their average weight's going up from week to week, then I know they're in a surplus. If the average weight is going down from week to week, then I know they're in a deficit. Uh, piece of cake, right? So how does this apply to you and your goals? Well, in a nutshell, the best environment for losing body fat is the one where you're in a calorie deficit. So in this instance, your average body weight should generally be dropping over time. Conversely, the best environment for gaining muscle is a hypercaloric environment where you're actively gaining weight each week on your average body weight. Yes, it is possible to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time and to recomp and things like that, but this typically only happens well in beginners, people coming back to the gym after a long layoff, or people who have a a dramatic performance enhancing drug cycle or, or a life altering training routine. If you start training, if you go from training three times a week to three times a day, it can happen. Now, outside of these instances, I recommend picking a target and going for it. Adjust your food intake and activity levels based on what's happened to your average body weight each week. If you're trying to gain weight on the scale and the scale's not budging, then you need to eat more plain and simple or move a little bit less. You can choose to weigh and measure your food if you'd like. So some people do better with exact measurements and really specific recommendations. Or you can do what I like to do personally and eyeball portion sizes, roughly tracking the food and, and adjusting based on how I respond. So this video is already getting a little too long, but I would also be screwing up and not telling the whole story if I didn't at least mention to you that the fact that things like macronutrient ratio, your proteins, carbs, and fats, quality of your food sources, vitamin and mineral intake, timing of your meals, and a few other things, all those things matter in the grand scheme of things. But the underlying driver of change that's typically worth getting in order first is getting a handle on your calories, along with learning to make good food choices that provide a lot of nutrients per calorie. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Please do me a favor and like them and share them with your friends. I gotta say, I gotta get some more followers on my channel because I've got a lot of good stuff coming your way that I really think can help a lot of people move better, feel better, look better, perform better. Uh, and I need your help to reach the masses. I'm Coach Ryan, and uh, time to blow this popsicle stand. Peace.